we've really made, I, I think, a good case that all these things align and show us that this is a really powerful lifestyle intervention exercise to improve the health of the gut microbiome. What is the number one lifestyle hack for a healthy gut microbiota? The answer, exercise. Contestable, but there's some pretty compelling data that shows us that exercise can improve not only the health of your gut microbiota, but also many other syndromes and symptoms like IBS, leaky gut, inflammatory bowel disease, and GERD. However, really importantly, there is a optimal amount of exercise load that has been shown to reduce leaky gut but if you exercise too much, this has also been shown conversely to increase leaky gut and symptoms. So thankfully, we have a 2023 meta-analysis that answers the question, what is the optimal loading of this lifestyle variable exercise for enhanced and optimal gut microbiota health? Okay, so let's break down how it is that exercise can optimize the health of the microbiota. And just one thing I want to call your attention to here, which is the microbiota, as you probably know, feeds off of things like fiber and prebiotics. So how is it that something that is not feeding the bacterial colony can lead to improvements in the colony of the bacteria and the function of said bacteria? This is because there are non-dietary factors that are really important in influencing the health of the gut microbiota. And one point in particular that's often overlooked, thankfully it's becoming more uh, appreciated in this conversation, is the importance of your immune system and how the immune system and the microbiota have this crosstalk that can either be healthy or I guess somewhat adversarial. There's a little bit of anatomy and, and a touch of a story I wanna tell you to help set the stage for the focus on the immune system as it pertains to things like leaky gut and health of your microbiota. Now, if we go way, way back in our evolutionary history, we see where our current anatomy of our GI tract comes from, which is a five foot large intestine, but a 22 foot small intestine. And why this is so important is because the large intestine is where most of the microbiota is housed, but at the same time, where a minimal amount of calories and nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine, 22 feet in length, where over 90% of calories and nutrients are absorbed, also where leaky gut and inflammation can occur and emanate from. But where does this come from? So going back 1.2 million years, there are two competing hominids one of which will become our ancestor and will inherit sort of their GI anatomy and another which we will not. And this ties in with diet, leaky gut, and then we'll bring it into the exercise protocol in a moment. But we have Homo agaster versus Paranthropus boisei. Now, boisei was kind of like a gorilla, very strong jaw, very powerful degulation, and could break down the plentiful rough grasses that were all over the region in Africa where this hominid lived. Now, at the same time, Homo agaster was more of a scavenger, eating all sorts of different foods. And because of this, he had a GI tract much more like our own, being omnivorous, whereas Boisei had more of a cow-like digestive tract with a really sort of capacious and robust large intestine with lots of bacteria that could leverage bacterial fermentation to break down and digest these grasses. When the climate in Africa changed and the grasslands dried out because it shifted to becoming more arid, Paranthropus boisei and his cow-like ruminant GI tract that was large intestine dependent died. And Homo agaster lived on. And this is whom from which we inherit our GI anatomy. And if we go even further down, or I guess, you know, more proximal to current day, advents like the hand axe allowed early hominids to scavenge even more animal uh, proteins and, and cholesterol-laden bone marrow, 
which did not require a robust and high level of bacteria, large intestine to process. So this is why current day, it's important to keep this in mind because there's a lot of attention being paid to the dense bacterial population in the large intestine while not appreciating enough about the small intestine. And part of this is because it's really easy to study the large intestine. Take a poop sample, <laughs> there you go. But with the small intestine, we can't really do that. It's in between mouth, stomach, and then large intestine. So it's very hard to get to. But when we understand that physiology, we understand why things like exercise, which reduce inflammation in a leaky gut, have a favorable impact on the microbiota and many symptoms and syndromes, independent of the fiber and prebiotics, which feed the colony of bacteria in the large intestine, which is less important. Okay, so hopefully that all makes sense. And I wanna weave that into the current finding about exercise in the microbiota. This comes from a 2023 systematic review looking at 28 studies. They included both healthy and ill or different disease state participants, including metabolic disorders, neurological, autoimmune, inflammatory bowel disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, and the elderly. And really importantly in this study, they controlled for confounders like diet, prebiotic, and probiotic intake, because all of these could skew the association. And with these confounders controlled for, they found that moderate to high intensity exercise increased diversity, increased beneficial bacterial populations, and also increased butyrate, a helpful short chain fatty acid. Additionally, they found that if you stopped exercising in just three weeks, you would see a regression of the positive shifts observed in the gut microbiota. And just briefly here, I wanted to cover some of the physiology of what's happening from exercise and where this benefit is in part conferred. And this comes from Frontiers Nutrition in 2021. I like this term, exercise as a ecosystem syntrophic, similar to symbiosis, something that fuels or feeds or fosters this symbiotic relationship between us, the host, and the residential commensal bacteria that we have this symbiotic relationship with. And you'll see a number of things as depicted in this graph, a bolstering of beneficial bacterial populations, an improvement in levels of short chain fatty acids, increased diversity, healthy metabolite production, improved barrier function, and a decreased inflammatory status. However, this is limited to the colonic, aka large intestine epithelium. And this is where I want to make sure that we tie interesting physiology to outcomes, meaning when these things shift in the body, will that result in you having less diarrhea, you having less bloating, you having less leaky gut? So let's take a moment and make sure that we're sort of fact-checking the physiology and documenting that the physiology and the changes therein lead to the health outcomes that you're hoping the physiology will spur. Let's start just briefly here with a few studies with a 2022 meta-analysis in IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And this is going to occur mostly in the small intestine. So this gives us a window into, are we hitting and favorably modulating what's happening in that crucial 22 feet in length aspect of our GI tract? And yes, they found the exercise improves IBS symptoms, whether it be bloating, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, gas, with a large effect size, meaning it was a clinically meaningful, noticeable improvement. So check one. Um, now, while we're in the realm of the small intestine, we should probably touch on leaky gut because this is where the majority, almost exclusively, leaky gut occurs. And excitingly, in a 2021 systematic review, they found that exercise reduces leaky gut. However, this is where the really important caveat comes in. They demonstrated separately to this that 60 minutes or over of high intensity exercise actually increased leaky gut. 
And if you talk to various professionals in exercise science, exercise physiology, you'll hear that high intensity for a prolonged period, especially when it's cardio, can lead to overtraining fairly quickly. In fact, if you catch the podcast we published maybe two months ago with Dr. Mike T. Nelson, we cover how I went too hard with prolonged high intensity cardio. And what do you know? I had GI symptoms resurge, including GERD, but also loose bowels and poor sleep. And this was a byproduct of my overtraining. So the sweet spot's really important. Again, I'll build this into the protocol that we'll detail here in just a moment. But let's touch on briefly inflammatory bowel disease. A 2022 meta-analysis found that exercise improves inflammatory bowel disease, which is autoimmune in nature, and oftentimes, but not exclusively, occurs in the small intestine. A separate 2019 meta-analysis found that exercise improves constipation, and then finally, a 2017 meta-analysis found that exercise improves GERD or gastroesophageal reflux with actually the ability to decrease that by 33%. We've now covered that the small intestine is a very important aspect of gut health. We've covered that exercise can improve the health of the microbiota and some of the physiology therein. And importantly, we've also tied this to important clinical outcomes like improvements in IBS, leaky gut, IBD, constipation, GERD. And so we've really made, I think, a good case that all these things align and show us that this is a really powerful lifestyle intervention exercise to improve the health of the gut microbiota. So this brings us to the protocol, which comes from a very recent 2023 meta-analysis. And what they recommend and what they found in this meta-analysis was you want a combination of aerobic and resistance training. It doesn't have to be in the same session, just within a week, you want to be doing both at moderate to high intensity. And to do so three to five times per week for 30 to 60 minutes. And part of this is to help bridle one from going too excessive and tipping into overtraining. And if this is done for a duration of eight weeks or longer, this is where we'll see the beneficial impact on the gut microbiota. Now, as a quick aside, if you're someone who's, let's say, highly conditioned and you're really prioritizing recovery and perhaps even going to periods of periodization where you're going to work harder and then recover, you can very likely do more than this. I just want to make sure it's on your radar screen that there is such a thing as training too much. And if you're not quite sure what a general target might be, this provides you with that. Now to the question of what types of exercise are moderate or high, just a few things that we've taken from some of the research out here. Moderate intensity would be defined as brisk walking, biking, swimming, hiking, or light jogging. High intensity would be running, jumping rope, cycling, hit or high intensity interval training, sports, or hiking uphill. And zooming way out, if you're confused, any exercise is gonna be better than nothing. There's sort of a axiom I try to live by, which is just don't do nothing, right? If it's a day when I'm supposed to lift weights and I don't quite have that in me, I'll do some low intensity cardio. And if I don't even feel up for that, maybe I'll do a walk and sit in the sauna, do some mobility, do some stretching. So important to not fall into, I guess, uh, complacency and also to have on offer a few different types of exercise that you can do that range in intensity. So that let's say you had a really long, hard work day and you had no chance to maybe work out in the morning or at lunch if that's when you normally go okay, maybe I can sneak in an easy bike ride or a light jog at the end of the day. And this really helps with one of the most important concepts, which is consistency. If you can be consistent, hence just don't do nothing, this is a crucially important aspect of accruing more fitness over time, right? If you are on a good trend for a month and then you don't exercise for one month or two months or whatever, you know, this really upsets as we covered within three weeks, you can see regressions from a microbiota perspective 
in the healthy benefits conferred from exercise. So consistency, and consistency, at least in my experience, is easier to achieve if you have various forms of exercise on offer and also ones that can be convenient. So the nice thing about a bike ride, presumably, is you could do that just riding right out of your garage. Or maybe you have some weights or bands or a rowing machine at home where if you can't go to a gym, you can do this at home. Uh, okay, so hopefully that helps. And remember, just don't do nothing. Exercise, one of the best things you can do from a lifestyle perspective to not only improve your health, but also improve the health of your gut microbiota. Mm -hmm.